I have not been this excited for a computer since I got my first unibody MacBook, which completely changed the course of my life. And this has the power to change so many other lives. Now, I don't mean to get too sentimental about gear and technology, but it's true that first original aluminum unibody MacBook, my first ever Apple laptop, gave me the ability to learn something completely new, which was filmmaking. The mix of power and tools like iMovie completely changed the trajectory of my life. And as silly as it sounds, without that laptop, I would not be here where I am today. So yeah, it's gear and technology, but it's also the power for the future generation of creators to do things that were previously impossible. Whether it's making an album that sounds completely new with new tools, or designing in a way that wasn't previously possible, or filmmaking with resolutions and quality and effects that you couldn't normally do, or creating crazy 3D worlds that would have required absolutely absurd computing before. Technology can change our lives, and the question is, will this 6 16-inch M1 Max MacBook Pro be one of those tools. The really wild stuff comes with the new Apple Silicon. If you didn't know, Apple switched from Intel chips to now making their own and doing it completely differently. They're basically putting all of these different things onto one chip, the GPU, the CPU, media engines, all of this stuff that traditionally would have been different parts all having to talk to each other and communicate, at the same time wasting performance and battery because it takes a lot of energy to power all of those chips. They even have ProRes engines built into this chip, which is absolutely wild. They claim that you're gonna be able to play seven streams of 8K ProRes video at the same time, which is, absolutely nuts. First we saw the M1 chips, which are more powerful and battery efficient, which rarely happens. Usually if you're upping the performance, the power, then it's gonna be less power efficient and vice versa. But here you're getting the best of both worlds. And I've been really eyeing those M1 MacBooks but I didn't buy one yet, and now we have the M1 Pro and M1 Max chips. The M1 Pro being on the 14-inch MacBook Pro and the M1 Max on the 16-inch MacBook Pro, and they're claiming four times faster GPU performance than the already insanely fast M1 chip, which, is absolutely crazy. So that's all really nice to hear, but what I, and I'm sure you are curious of, is how does that actually affect our daily workflows with our computers as content creators, filmmakers, photographers, graphic designers? And what I'm really curious about is how does Final Cut Pro X now perform with these new chips? There's a few codecs out there that are pretty tough to edit, and then also, does it affect export times? Are we getting crazy fast export times now? That's the stuff that I'm most curious about. And we have a 16-inch M1 Max MacBook Pro with 10-core CPU and 30-core GPU, 64 gigabytes of unified memory, and two terabytes of SSD storage, almost fully spec'd out except for the storage. I did order my own M1 Max, 16 inch MacBook Pro and got eight terabytes of storage on that. And a lot of people are like, why would you get eight terabytes? And there always comes a time where I run out of space on my computer when I'm editing a big project. And then it's just such a nightmare. So I vowed to myself, I would always max out the storage on whatever laptop I get to never run into that problem. I am future-proofing myself. So here's what we found in terms of performance with Final Cut Pro 10. The intro that you saw there, that was shot in 6K ProRes RAW 
and absolutely no problems with that. Just flawlessly, super easy to edit. Six streams of 6K ProRes RAW, no problems at all. Super smooth, you can scrub through, easy. Let's do nine, still. <laughs> works flawlessly, no issues at all. So I think what they're claiming is definitely true. I didn't have 8K ProRes footage to test out, but from everything I've seen, ProRes, no issues at all. But ProRes is a fairly easy codec to work with. What about some of the harder stuff? And so some of the other footage in that intro we filmed on the Sony in H.265. H.265 footage, easy 4K, no problems at all. On the previous gen 16 inch MacBook Pro, it was pretty good, but if you press play, there'd be like a little pause and then it'd start playing. It wasn't immediate here. We're not seeing really any of that. No issues at all with H.265, which means that I think we can start filming all of our videos like I am right now in H.265, which means a lot less data and that means we're gonna be saving a lot of money in terms of storage. Maybe I didn't need that eight terabytes of storage after all, we'll see. Then let's look at DJI drone footage. The codec we all know isn't quite the strongest and so it's really hard for the programs. Again, no issues at, at all here, like so smooth and no issues, even with a color grade adjustment layers, no issues at all. You can edit the footage straight. You don't need proxies or ProRes or anything like that. What about R5 footage? Probably one of the biggest reasons I switched from Canon to Sony was that I just couldn't edit the footage. It was just so slow. Now, Smooth like butter, no issues at all. So smooth. Uh, so yeah, technically I could switch back to Canon, but I think I'm gonna stay with Sony for now. And then for us, the hardest codec to work with is FPV footage after it's gone through real steady. I don't know exactly what this codec is, but it is very hard for Final Cut to deal with. And here's where we run into some issues. It's not as smooth as the other codecs that we've seen up until this point. There are still some issues with this, but this is arguably a fairly niche codec to be working with. I don't think that many people are doing FPV stuff right now and running it through real steady. So overall, the performance in Final Cut Pro 10 is absolutely nuts. Way better than I've ever seen on any laptop. You will have no problems editing on this machine. But what about exporting? So this isn't scientific at all, but we exported the exact same clip, the same length on our previous gen 16 inch MacBook Pro and then on the new M1 Max MacBook Pro. And we found consistently that the M1 Max 16 inch MacBook Pro was 20% faster than the previous generation. And that, I don't know if that sounds like a lot to you or not, but that ends up adding up pretty quickly. That means when you're doing an hour long export, instead of it being 60 minutes, it's now 48 minutes. And for some of you, if you're like me and you're exporting every single day, some sort of piece of content, that's gonna add up really fast and I haven't calculated right now, but I'm gonna assume it's hours of my life throughout the year that I'm gonna be saving with this 20% faster export. So yeah, as a filmmaker, you're gonna be able to do so much more on the new M1 Max chip. And I, that's not even talking about all of the crazy 3D rendering, 3D animation stuff that you can do on a laptop. Before you would have needed insane, super expensive, hardware to really work with 3D and animation stuff. Now we're getting way better performance there. I, I'm not doing that stuff, but from everything I've heard from some really professional people, it is absolutely wild. And one of the things that most interested me about the original M1 MacBook Pros was the battery life. And now it's getting even crazier with 21 hours of battery life on the 16 inch MacBook Pro. And not just that, you're not getting a throttling of the performance while you're on the battery. So not only are you getting better battery life, but you're also keeping the performance up, 
which is just, that can literally be game changing for people, whether you're editing on the road or an airplane or wherever you are and you don't have a power outlet, you're gonna be able to edit a video for a very long time without your laptop dying in the middle of your project. And then let's talk ports. We finally got back some of the ports that we've missed so much like HDMI and an SD card reader. We still have three Thunderbolt USB-C ports and we have MagSafe, which I love. MagSafe was incredible. I was sad to see it go and it's so nice to have it back. And interestingly, I also like that you can still charge through the Thunderbolt ports. That's not going anywhere, but we have MagSafe. It's just so satisfying when it connects. And then one of my favorite things, they got rid of that touch bar. I was never a fan of a touch bar because I didn't know if I was hitting the right thing. And with keyboard shortcuts, I don't wanna have to look down at the keyboard to press them. It kind of defeats the purpose. That's gone, I'm glad. And the keyboard, I love it now. It's so much better. We kind of went back to what really works and it just looks really sleek. I like the black background of the keyboard it looks really great and most importantly it just works really well we still have a little fingerprint touch ID we're not getting the face ID but we got that nice touch ID which I still really like the display is one of those things that I feel like is going a little bit under the radar just because there's so much cool stuff happening, especially with the chips. But this display is really nice. And right away, I wanted to kind of compare it to the previous Gen 16 inch. We played the same thing and you can tell the difference between the displays. The colors are a lot more accurate on the new 16 inch. You can definitely tell there's more contrast now. The shadows are a nice deep, dark black and then with the highlights the roll off is a little bit nicer you can definitely tell the difference in person when you're looking at the two displays it's a liquid retina xdr display and it's capable of 120 hertz but you might have heard me talk about this before i don't really care about 120 hertz that much so it is nice that you can actually go into the settings and change it to whatever refresh rate that you want that makes a lot of sense if this is going to be a pro computer we need that control. It has a 1000 nit sustained brightness and the peak is 1600 with a contrast ratio of 1 million to one. This is an HDR display so you can actually do the whole HDR workflow now on your MacBook Pro. When you see this display you're gonna love it and if that's not enough you can actually plug in three of those giant XDR monitors and still a 4K TV all at once, which I don't, I don't know who needs that much screen real estate, but if you need it, you got it. The speakers, somehow they've made them better once again. Again, we compared it to the previous Gen 16 inch. <laughs> definitely hear more bass and the sound is more clean and more rich than the previous 16 inch which already had by far the best speakers on a laptop that I've ever heard in my life. New 1080 webcam long awaited that's kind of a given and with that comes possibly the most controversial thing about the new MacBook Pros the notch and at first I was a little bit worried but after using it for a little bit I'm not even noticing. It doesn't go over top of a YouTube video or your Netflix show. So there really isn't an issue there. You're just getting more screen real estate. Looks wise, it's maybe not the best, but I don't know. It's not gonna make any difference in my day-to-day -day workflow, that's for sure. Okay, okay, maybe you're saying that all sounds incredible, but it's just way too expensive. And I'm not gonna lie, it's not cheap, especially to max out. It is very expensive. 
but two things. This laptop, this computer might allow you to do things that you could not have done before. And that has quite a bit of value. Like I talked about in the beginning, it could literally change your life like it did for me. And the second thing is, if you're doing exporting like I am every single day, it's gonna save you time and that time equals money. Let's just say, let's just say you make $20 an hour. Let's just throw that out. And uh, let's say I, I render one hour of video a day, about five days a week, let's say 48 weeks a year. That's 240 hours. Now saving that 20%, is now 192 hours, which means I am saving 48 hours a year, 48 times 20, $960. It's about $1,000 a year at $20 an hour. And I'm sure a lot of you are charging more than $20 an hour. It's gonna add up really fast. And even though it might cost a little bit more at first, you're gonna make that money back guaranteed. And that's, that's why I'm okay spending a lot of money because this is gonna save me time, save me money over the years. I'm beyond excited for myself our workflow, the performance, the speed, the battery life, all of that stuff. But I'm almost more excited to see what you, the next generation of creatives do with this machine. And I love that now us professionals, creative professionals have a pro laptop that fits our needs. Dare I say it, the perfect laptop.